Like that's fine. Thank you. Okay, and um, uh, today's talk uh, is quite uh, important, complex ethical considerations in the practice of pediatric surgery, and uh, the presenter is Dr. Kerat Botha, who is uh, a medical officer that is a junior trainee in our department, and in the future he intends to become a pediatric surgeon. Uh, we are. Uh, honored and happy and proud that we have Dr. John Sekabira as our invited guest today. And uh, couldn't have got any, any, um, uh, any uh, 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 guest better than John because uh, in 2015, John was one of the three pediatric surgeons in Uganda. And the population of Uganda is, is about 30 million or, or 40 million, if I, John may correct me. So at that time, there were about 20 million children in Uganda, and he was one of the three pediatric surgeons there. And, um, and he trained in Uganda, also in the UK, and he has got a very strong connection to our country because he trained for over two years uh, with Professor Hadley Keen in Durban in South Africa. Uh, John is a very humble man, what I've come to know of him. He will never say any, a lot at all, never say much about his work, but he is um, probably a founding member of COSEXA, that is the College of East African Surgeons, um, East African Surgeons. He is also a board member of Global Initiative in Children's Surgery, and he has strong ties with pediatric surgical associations in the West. Sorry. Those who do not know about John, I urge them to read this scientific publication in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. And that was the Hugh Greenwood lecture, which John was invited. To. He was the first speaker or, or person who delivered this lecture. And this describes John's remarkable and inspirational story from internship to becoming a pediatric surgeon in Uganda. And I know recently John and his hospital um, have received um, a state of the art pediatric operation theater from the kids OR organization <clears throat> from our beloved Scotland. And um, so without much delay, I will invite now Dr. Botha to do his presentation. After that, we will invite Dr. Sekabira, and then we have stalwarts here who will give their opinions after Dr. John has finished his talk. So, Kerry, I'll stop sharing, and you can start sharing. Thank you, Prof. Um, let me just get that out of the way. There we go. Can you see my slide? Yeah, we can see it. And you can you can start now thank you welcome all um i will be talking about ethical considerations in the practice of pediatric surgery um we'll be especially focusing on uh resource limited settings looking at resource allocation lack of picu beds and the implications for both patients and the healthcare workers um so let's start off with what are ethics well, at its simplest, it's a system of moral principles and perceptions about what is right versus wrong. These principles affect how we make decisions and are concerned with what is good for individuals as well as society. Talking about resource allocation, this is aiming to do the most with what is available. This becomes a problem once demand exceeds supply, which is something we frequently experience. So how do we decide on who gets what? A few important considerations are that we need real-time information. We need to know what is available as well as what is needed um, to allocate resources. We need to know what has the highest priority. A simple example being that when limited theater time is available, an emergency procedure would certainly take preference over elective one. We also need to know the nature of the resource itself, as this can play a major role in distribution as well as how we go about solving problems. 
Is it something that we can easily purchase if the budget allows? Or is it something such as experienced senior clinicians that cannot just be bought as the need arises? So firstly, let me just mention that we um, work at two hospitals, Frey Hospital, as well as Cecilia Makawani Hospital. Um, they're located 25 kilometers apart in Eastern Cape. Sorry. What do we have um, talking about our resources? We are fortunate to have the expertise of five consultants, three registrars, as well as five medical officers and a dedicated secretary in our department. Together, this team caters to OPD visits, ward rounds, surgical emergencies, and all the service provision, provision and academic needs of our department. We are also very reliant on all of the nursing staff at both hospitals. At Frey, we have two dedicated theatre days, a specialized pediatric theatre with access to an aesthetic consultant, with theatre time for emergency cases 24-7, 365 days of the year as the need arises. Um, the majority of our emergency work is done at Frey Hospital. We have access to a combined pediatric and neonatal intensive care unit with seven beds shared between ourselves, pediatrics, cardiothoracics, neurosurgery, and even occasionally orthopedic surgery. A general ward with only six beds in our cubicle, but we frequently overflow. Um, just recently, we've had 15 patients in the ward. And we have a single burns ward that is shared between adult male and female patients, as well as the children, um, where we have beds for four children at a time. At Cecilia Makawani Hospital, we have access to a 12-bedded neonatal ICU, two full days theatre lists per week with an anesthetic consultant available one of these days. Um, an emergency theatre time as the need arises, but this is only during working hours. Seven beds in a burn ward and a spacious general ward. Most of the emergency conditions and acute conditions are treated at Frey Hospital um, as the patients get closer monitoring and this is where we are after hours. This slide gives a summary of what is going on in our department. These are actually the stats from last month. Between the two hospitals, we attend to almost 300 OPD visits, more than 160 admissions to our general ward. 13 patients were admitted um, with burns, all of which were large percentages, mostly more than 20%, and a total of 90 theater cases, with more than 30 of these being um, emergency cases and the majority of them being done at Frey Hospital. <clears throat> Talking a bit broader, what does Africa need? Although Africa has only 11% of the world's population, it has been found to bear 25% of the global burden of disease. Multiple factors contribute to this high burden of disease from endemic poverty to poor literacy. South Africa is a low middle income country, one of the countries with the widest income gap, a population of approximately 60 million with only 12% of these having medical aid. The tax base is made up of 14 to 15% of this population. And a study done by um, Pete Surge Africa Research Collaboration presented in 2018 showed that the 30 day mortality of patients in Sub Saharan Africa was 10% as compared to 0.7% in high income countries. We need to focus on what counts. Um, so often focus has been placed on the prevention and treatment of infectious diseases rather than uh, that of trauma or surgical diseases in children. Surgery remains an important part of basic healthcare, even though it's frequently considered to have a high cost and limited availability due to the need of trained staff and expensive equipment. However, Goslin et al. performed a cost-effective analysis um, to evaluate the cost and disability adjusted life years saved by the provision of surgical services to children in a rural hospital in Sierra Leone. And he found that um, there was a positive effect compared to that of other healthcare interventions. South Africa needs to remain attractive um, to newly qualified surgeons. Many South African doctors immigrate. It was estimated that approximately 50% of South African trained doctors had immigrated. In May of this year, eight new pediatric surgeons qualified. However, there were only three posts available in the state sector. 
Thus, five of these newly qualified doctors will be forced to go into private practice, increasing the surgeons attending to this 12% of the population with medical aids. This while we still have three provinces without any pediatric surgeons. The following information is from a review article that was published in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery in 2018. Um, it focuses on the pediatric surgery, surgeon density in South Africa. It found that there were 2.6 pediatric surgeons per million of the uninsured population under 14 years versus 9.4 per million for the insured population under 14 years. That's just shy of four times the amount per million. This highlights the socioeconomic maldistribution of pediatric surgical workforce in South Africa. We also fall short of the international recommendation of one pediatric surgeon per 500,000 of the population. And this table serves to compare our pediatric surgeons per million of the zero to 14 year old age group. It's almost ridiculous when comparing it to the high density of pediatric surgeons in the United States of America, but we are very fortunate compared to one of our BRICS countries, India, with more than double the amount of pediatric surgeons per million um, than they have. And even more fortunate if you compare it to one of our neighboring countries, Mozambique, that has no pediatric surgeons. Here's just a graphical representation of um, the amount of pediatric surgeons in South Africa per province. Um, as you can see, we have quite a geographically limited distribution, with Gauteng having by far the majority of 15. KwaZulu-Natal, Western Cape, Eastern Cape, and Limpopo are all close to each other with um, eight and seven. And then the Free State has two, whereas Mpumalanga, Northwest, and Northern Cape do not have any at this time. This slide um, looks at the workforce distribution of um, pediatric surgeons in South Africa. It shows specialists, medical officers, and registrars. Medical officers and registrars work solely in the public sector. However, in 2018, it was noted that of the specialists, 40% um, worked in the public sector, 20% worked in the private sector, and 38% worked in both. This slide does give us some hope for the future. Looking at the high number of registrars and the high number of specialists, um, it's hopeful that the number of pediatric surgeons will be increasing. Next, moving on to our um, topic of lack of ICU beds. Now, ICU bed is in, unlike any other bed in the hospital. Um, if your patient needs close monitoring, um, there's strained staff, strain staff attending to them. It's one of the best places for a sick child to be before or after a major operation. But this ideal level of care cannot be offered in unlimited quantity. At Frey Hospital, as mentioned, we have seven of these potentially life-saving spaces available. They are the only beds that can house ventilated patients as well as patients requiring inotropic support. We frequently must postpone theater cases while waiting for a bed to open up. And we are also very reliant on these beds um, and do not have any high care beds in either our general or burns ward. <clears throat> Let us discuss a case I had to deal with recently. One night when I was on duty, I received a call from one of our referral hospitals more than 100 kilometers away from Frey. There um, at the hospital, there was a single medical officer in the emergency unit trying to attend to the needs of a mother and two children involved in a shack fire. This hospital does not even have as much as a dial of flow to control the rate of intravenous fluid administration. Both children were reported to have sustained more than 50% flame burns, also involving their faces with potential inhalation injury. What was needed? Well, we needed two PICU beds for two patients who were likely shocked and potentially will need ventilation. But what was available? We only had one possible mover out of ICU to the ward. So just looking at the literature, um, the following information is from a retrospective cohort study that was done on patients younger than 10 years admitted to the Pediatric Burns ICU at Chris Arne Baragwanath Academic Hospital, all the way from January 2013 to December of 2017. It was done by one of the recently qualified pediatric surgeons. 
Chris Hani Baraguana is a very fortunate institution in that they have a pediatric burns ICU. And this study showed um, the mortality of patients that were direct admissions versus those patients that were transferred in. As you can see, it was less than 20% in direct admissions to transfers more than about 50%. <clears throat> This table shows um, some information regarding the different types of admissions they had, different mechanisms of injury. We can see that um, flame burns were the second most common mode of injury and that patients transferred in with flame burns had a very high mortality, 31%. So from this, we can know that patients with flame burns affecting more than 40% of the total body surface area were at a higher risk of mortality. So mechanism of injury, total body surface area, and type of emission all seem to play a role in um, prognosis. And in terms of these, all of our patients were at a worse prognosis. So my question to you tonight is, what would the ethical thing be to do? What would you have done in this situation? What could we have done? And then just to tell you what we did do in the end. So we tried our best with what was available at the time. The dilemma was whether the two children were salvageable um, in our setup or not. In our setup, burns more than 35 to 40% total body surface area are non-salvageable. These two patients were initially managed at the referral hospital and all necessary advice was offered to the referring doctor. After exposure of the wounds the following day, we found that the burns when calculated were 32 and 23%, thus both salvageable. Um, as soon as we had one bed open up, we had transferred the child with 23%, we had collected because they had a better chance of survival, <laughs> and continued management at Frey Hospital. Um, as far as I was knowing before going on leave, we were trying to get the other sibling transferred as well. So what are the implications of this for our patients? Um, implications can vary greatly. Um, a delay in elective surgery can be quite the inconvenience, but for a patient needing an emergency procedure Procedure delay can be the difference between life and death. We need to prioritize um, who gets treated next. Um, for our parents, they tend to understand when smaller children or emergencies need to be operated before elective cases. However, during this time, many of our elective cases have been postponed. Parents do get frustrated with this. However, we do our best to do open explanations, um, telling them the reasons why. This does help our doctor-patient relationship. Even though they may not be happy, at least they understand. What are the implications for us? Well, healthcare workers can find themselves feeling guilty for something they do not always have control over. In such a case as the last bed dilemma, all of us would do our best to save both patients. But when Unable to do so, feelings of guilt would be common. Whatever we choose, we will be doing something wrong, it feels like. And this is a genuine moral dilemma. We get frustrated by the limitations of the resources at our disposal. We get angry for the situations we get, are in. And then after this, we get sad. So in conclusion, Africa is a young continent with 50% of people being young. One of the poorest in resource allocation for healthcare, we have critical shortages of both human and consumable resources. And surgery is getting neglected um, and pediatric surgery even more so being the orphan child of surgery. Some of the solutions we have is that we have the universal healthcare in South Africa or the plan. We need to train specialists, we need to recruit them, and we need to retain them. Make South Africa an attractive option, especially the state sector. Get some doctors into those three provinces that do not have um, pediatric surgeons yet. 
And on a global level, we have the Global Initiative in Children's Surgery, which we are proud to say that one of our senior staff members is a board member of. These are just some of my references. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was an excellent summary. And uh, you have stated the case very nicely. And thank you for presenting even when you are on leave and you are more than seven, 800 kilometers away from East London, but that's the beauty of the technology. So the Kerry, well done. If you can stop sharing, then I will uh, invite Dr. Sekabira. Uh, John, you can share your screen. And uh, while John is, is uh, sharing, trying to share his screen, how things are relative that um, I, I sort of uh, had to do introspection when I read John's story uh, and John will tell his story uh, himself that we in South Africa, we always keep complaining and uh, that we have limited resources. So there are countries which are in Africa who have almost nothing. And uh, so I think we just need to have the perspective when we say limitation of resources, it's a relative term. So John, please go ahead, welcome again. Thank you, Milind. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. And <laughs> I'm actually humbled. What I wanted to say is when I got this talking about this topic, when I got this invitation, I was wondering what I'm going to talk about. Sorry. So I'm failing to move on the cursor, sorry. Uh, my talk is going to go like this. I'm going to have an overview of pediatric surgery in Uganda, some challenges and a few successes. And then I will try to go an overview of medical ethics, uh, which will also include ethical aspects of pediatric surgery. As you know, Uganda is a low, a low income country and the population distribution, of, as you can see, if you compare Uganda and the US, our population is really young. We have children uh, below 15 years, they constitute almost 50% of the population. So you can find, as Dr. Tamil in, in his introduction mentioned, you find that the burden of conditions to treat really fall on those who manage children. And the pediatric surgery being one of the specialties managing childhood conditions, really we get the biggest brand of treating these children, these patients. Uh, as you can see from that picture, Uganda children below 14 years, the children below 14 years constitute 20 million. And the currently we have six pediatric surgeons. So if you consider the US standards, that is the APSA standard, which was passed some time back, uh, which recommends one pediatric, pediatric surgeon to every 100,000 children, then you would need 200 pediatric surgeons at this moment. So it means we have a deficit of 194. And that is a similar scenario when you consider other African countries. And if you can see USA has a population of children below 14 years, which is 61 million. And how many pediatric surgeons do they have? 1,250. So they need 610. So they have a surplus. And when you talk about ethics of equity, I think we should be blaming United States because they should be giving, distributing these pediatric surgeons to other countries in need. 
And I think the similar scenario plays in when you consider other can developed countries, they probably have an excess of pediatric surgeons. Uh, not until recently when we started this program of training pediatric surgeons, on the picture on the right, you can see graduates of pediatric surgeons, as you mentioned, in pre, not until recently, Mozambique did not have a single pediatric surgeon. But now in 2016, they managed to get one pediatric surgeon graduating um, through Cosexa. And so is Rwanda, just got there as on 2016. And so you can see the effort is ongoing, but I think we have a very long way to go because at that rate, if we just go graduate one or two, how many years do you need to graduate enough pediatric surgeons to meet the demand? I think it can take us so many hundreds of years. So we need to find out ways of how we can even train and train and train more pediatric surgeons so that our population does not continue suffering. Currently, most of the surgeries are being done by general surgeons in general hospitals. And as you can imagine, sometimes the outcome is not good as I'm going to show you in the subsequent pictures. Sorry. Uh, in that picture, you can see the trainees, the pediatric surgery, uh, some have now since qualified, but this is an ongoing program, some of them who are not training. And we have a big number of collaborators spaced all over the world who have been helping us in this training program. Some are in the US, some in Canada. And so these have been very, no, this picture is not ex exhaustive. We have so many who have not been included in this picture, but thanks to these ladies and gentlemen, we have managed to start a training program, which has managed to scale up our, to, to scale up the output of pediatric surgeon. As the, most of the literature are written and most of our addresses, the challenges of pediatric surgery are enormous. In that picture, you can imagine the people waiting to see just in one day clinic, how many of those patients are waiting to me to see, probably one doctor. And they can turn up in hundreds on a single day. And when you talk about ethics and equity, and the burnout and all that, how can that doctor see all these patients and they continue being ethical? So, so there are some of the challenges which pediatric surgeons can meet. And you, in a single day, every day, this is the picture which always plays out. So really it is so, it's a big challenge. So another picture, another scenario which comes out is lack of resources and poor infrastructure. So some of the challenges we face, not until recently, before the coming of Kids OR and the renovations of Fumalago just a few years ago. This used to be the picture in our, we call it like a nursery, where our babies used to be nursed. In the picture, you can see how they are being clumped together in small courts. I don't know whether you can see my casa. And then the tubing to supply oxygen, connecting the Y connections between the tubing so they could deliver oxygen. And this picture, you could see fluids being titrated in syringes because we didn't have infusion pumps so thereby you could give children fluid so that you can get treatment. And this was tiring and this could be done by one nurse who would be wading through a population of like 50 babies in NASA. So you can imagine what kind of quality of care that be. 
and another wolf inf lack of infrastructure. This is a picture illustrates the warming you could have instead of a baby losing temperature. I think you can see here, if you can see my cursor, this was like a, a electric warmer, which was connected to, connected to electricity. And then a baby is wrapped in cotton so that it can preserve the heat. And this was like the way so that we keep warm for surgical babies. And this used to be the picture. And you can see the warm gloves scenario where you to put water in the warm gloves. Before you can start on surgery, you put it on, on a warmer and then you put, you put the, under the blood, the bedding, the, the sheets, so that you could warm the baby and so that they go through the surgery. And so that by the time you finish these babies are not hypothermic and the consequences of hypothermia can be devastating. Uh, the issue of anesthesia has also been trying to anesthesia because as you can imagine, you can't do safe surgery without having safe anesthesia. It also went back to a program to start stimulate young doctor to start training as pediatric anesthesiologist. So far we have two ladies who are already played this, okay, three who have already, and the gentleman, doctor, who have already finished training in the pediatric surgery, other pediatric anesthesiology. This has been done in collaboration with the universities, in, one of them training in Cape Town, another one in the University of British Columbia. And the others are also training and it's ongoing so that we can also improve the safety of our children during surgery. Uh, this picture I took to show some rural hospital whereby some of the children can are being operated. This is one of the regional hospitals. You can see the infrastructure of the hospitals. This hospital we are building in 1950s probably. And probably they have nothing to show that you can safely treat a child safely and they survive. And here in this picture, you could see the congestion in the ward. And so really such pictures are still going on. In the previous slide, I talked about complications which can take place when, which can ensue when as children are being treated by general surgeons. We can't avoid it because most of the children are being treated by our colleagues, general surgeons. But as you can imagine, this is like a stenosed colostomy, which was placed probably for ash plants. And after that, then they have to come to us and then we have to revisit and do all this corrective surgery. Then the proper, improper, improper plastic colostomy, to get a lot of colostomy prolapses. And you can imagine after opening up, you can see a child who delayed presentations and have this, rather a child after like this tennis distoma, you open up and you find this bow, which is like a cut tire, and you have to decide what you are going to do, whether to resect this bow, because probably it will never function or not. Some of this, like you can get the 18 year old, you come with the colostomies and you have a waste band because of the rugs they use to tie the colostomy. And this one is like an unknown operation which child presents with the colostomy and it has incisions all over the place and on the abdomen. And you wonder what you are going, what your next steps are going to be. So such children are very many. Another big challenge is the late presentation. And these children, because of lack of appropriate care, the children come like this one with cash pranks, presents at nine years. So you have to find a way of treating these children. And this one, the child has never gone to school and comes to you and you support, make decisions how you are going to treat them. These are some of the chibiolet presenters, which child comes with cash pranks and you have to deal with it. Some of them, you are supposed to throw part of the bow, the colony in the bucket because 
even if you put a replacer colostomy, such colony will never come back to a normal size so that it can function properly. Uh, we have challenges of some of the conditions we get, especially in managing the neonates. And not until recently, we used to have high mortality of for children, for example, with gastroschisis. As you can see in one of the papers which we published in 2016, which one of our, by then was a, a resident surgeon, doing surgical residence. By then, the only, until recently, there was only one child surviving out of the cohort of 47 patients. So you could see the high mortality rate. So managing a neonates with the surgical conditions was very challenging. Another challenging condition is of late presentation is getting tumors which present very late. You can see in that slide, a child who present with Williams tumor, very emaciated, but I remember, okay, even when we were in Durban in South Africa with Professor Hadley, we could see also such children coming into Durban. So probably this picture is not exclusively, so, but I think when it comes to Uganda, we just get such children, very many. And when you think about if you can ever do any primary surgery, I think this one is going to be, it can't be thought about that you can end up doing primary surgery like Americans do. So these children are supposed to be optimized, and improve their nutrition as you give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And probably that is the only way you can probably save them, improve outcome. I talked about the high mortality rate of gastroschisis. This paper shows one of the efforts by one of the, our colleagues in one of the hospitals where pediatric surgeons are, that is in Mbarara, by trying innovative ways of trying to reduce, reduce mortality due to gastroschisis. So they managed in a period of two years to reduce mortality by 50%, and this paper was published in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. And you can see this picture, this is the surgeon, now she's a pediatric surgeon, her interest started when she was a when she was doing surgical residency. That is the one who published the paper of the high mortality, which was almost 99%. But she went ahead and took it upon herself to see that improvement in mortality, in mortality for gastroschisis is observed. And right now, we have tried to reduce mortality for gastroschisis to reasonable numbers which are comparable to other parts of South Africa, of the of Africa. And we still, of course, has a, have a backlog of, we still have a backlog of pediatric surgical conditions. And as you can see between Barala, that's where we have pediatric surgeons. They basically, we, they, we do most of our cases are emergencies. So what happened to Active condition like a children will give colostomies. Probably they are they are the ones who are languishing in the rural areas, have not access appropriate corrective surgery. And this probably goes on for anorectal malformations and hash crimes, which require staged surgical procedures. And these children end up probably missing out on collecting their surgery early enough to improve their outcomes. Uh, this was one of the papers which we published way back in 2014, which was showing the animate amate and for neonate surgical disease and the burden of surgical conditions in the neonate surgical conditions. And as you can see, most of the burden, if you consider, for example, electron malformation, the only met need is around, is around 10%. So the unmet need constitutes, if you consider dalis, constitutes the biggest percentage of the dalis. And only unmetable need is just it. So, and this plays out even for hash primes, 
And when to consider for those cases, the animate needs is way high. And even for other conditions like atresia and so is for teratomas. So you can find the burden of neonatal surgical conditions is high even in our country. So this slide should try to show you some of the conditions. Children we have treated it successfully and we go on rejoicing. And as you can state it there that it takes the enthusiasm of an individual to improvise so that these children can survive. Some of the children who are survivors come back and we try to rejoice with their parents. And this keeps us probably our moods and keeps our spirits high. For example, not long ago, you could hardly see children with tracheosophagus fistula surviving, but they have started coming back in the clinics. And when you review them, you have to take pictures so that you celebrate as a team. And even child mothers with gastros kisses come back and we consider it as a, a, a small success. And some of the children come back and they have already started going to school. So those are the few success stories we are having in our children, in our practice. And with the collaboration, we don't forget his such work. We have continued publishing in some of the high impact journals. So we continue showing how work. Not until recently, we started embarking on even starting doing complex surgeries. We started the pioneering in simpler conditions, like initially this picture shows the conjoined twins, which came with the anorectal malformation. Of course, they had no end opening, and initially we had to place colostomies as the initial step. And later on, they went up having separation successfully. And so that one was the, our, for some of our success stories. And then I mentioned sometimes the enthusiasm of the individual surgeons. I can show in the picture what it takes, for example, what it used to take to a child, a child who had, for example, Sophia Tresia survive. This child, we had to take an athletic machine, which you can see here in the picture. You can see this was the old dinner comment. I think in 1992 model, we had it now to close the theater and we took with the baby to ventilate in a small niche which we improvised and we managed to save this baby. And in this picture on the right, you can see also a baby. So it took us as you could have to make a deuteroster of doctors that including anesthesiologists, surgeons, so that we are the one who kept the baby through the night and so that this baby could also survive. So that is the enthusiasm of the doctors which they take so that such babies can survive. And this is just recently a complex, now we started doing complex um, conjoint twin separation. This is the picture before we started doing the babies, working on the baby, this is the team assembled together in the OR, together picture with the parents. And we embarked on like a 20, a 20 hour operation of this joint, conjoint twins, which we are joined at lower back. And that included even separating the nerves of the sacroplexus and the cauda aquina. And did the two parts, we had to work together with orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons to do the, who we are doing the, Interoperative neuro monitoring, and we successfully separated these twins. So, and so these are some of the success stories we have been having. And we try to bring together all stakeholders who have been helping us. In that paper, I showed you the who were all over the world. In 2019, we had a conference which had been in Kampala, tried to chat ways how we can improve pediatric surgery for pediatric surgical services in the country and the outcome proceedings of this meeting we are published in the Madi Journal of Surgery of 2020. 
And in a way of mitigating the suffering of children, even in the upcountry hospitals, where children cannot access the center, like in places where we have only two centers, where we have pediatric surgery, we, start, we started doing outreach surgical camps. And this one, we do them in collaboration with colleagues from North America who bring the resources, necessary resources like sutures, anesthetic drugs, and even other supplies, so that we go and camp in a regional hospital, sometimes even a district hospitals, so that we can correct some of the surgical, con surgical conditions for children who cannot access the, the center. And that way we can reduce the backlog. And also, as I mentioned earlier, some of these children are being treated by our colleague general surgeons, sometimes even medical officers. So we tend to have skills transfer so that these local clinicians can start gaining confidence in treating some of these conditions. And start by doing radio announcements and we make screening visits. And then we call our international colleagues and we start embarking on usually a week long surgical camps. And we have successfully carried out civil surgical camps. And this slide, you can see the conditions we have treated in the different surgical camps we have held. This was a slide of up to 2017, but since then, we have carried out even more. But of course, now with the COVID, everything has slowed down. But that way, we had managed to reduce much of the backlog of the surgical conditions, even in the Low and uh, you can see as advocacy, this are some of the in the local press as this young ch sixty children with the with the anorectal trauma formation where and other surgical conditions where are treated in one camp in the areas, and also part of quality improvement, we can we hold hold the workshops about pediatric surgical emergencies. And this one was in a rural, rather regional referral hospital in Imbarara, where our pediatric surgical colleagues are working. And this also helped to improve the, the, the outcome of children with surgical condition. Uh, not until recently, we started, we started actually, I can proudly say that kids go are started in Uganda because this was a charity, Scots charity organization, which started as Arch Foundation. We started with collaborating with Professor Youngstone, whom we all know. And because he comes from Scotland, he was a, he was by then a board chair of Arch Foundation. And so he started soliciting funds, collecting funds from there. And indeed, they built the first pediatric surgery hospital in Kampala. And from then, we started the work in showing that it can work and so the economic benefit, for which we published a paper which came out in 2018. And this has been having a very big impact, which showed that investing a dollar in the children's services can improve the survival and save the dollars and first that disability and just the life years averted by, for example, just investing $1, another $60. And this has been having a very big impact. And from then, Kids O'Hara was born because David Cunningham was first the CEO of Arch Foundation. And because then it metamorphosed to the truth. The kids all are. And of course, we are the first beneficiary of the Arch for other kids all are. And they built the first theaters, the first two theaters, one in Imbarara and another in Kampala. But as we talk now, they have refurbished the three theater suits in the Mulago National Refer Hospitals. And really, this has gone way improved the surgical outcome of our children because now we have warmers, we have a very dedicated 
the theater teams. So, and of course, working in a very good conditions, working condition, it's very stimulating to the staff. So thanks to Kids OR, we have managed to improve the surgical outcome of children in the, not only in Uganda, but as you can imagine, this Kids OR has gone on to build these theaters in other sites. As I talk now, they are in Zambia, kitting up more theaters for children. I think they have done it even in West Africa, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, Ghana. So really Kids OR has done a lot as far as improving children surgery in the world of concern. Now going back to what's about medical ethics. Dr. Botha mentioned, has been mentioning all of the things what I wanted to talk about. But as I want to say that doctors, they deal with a variety of ethical issues. And the commonest I can mention when you such literature and in our practice is the challenges we meet as uh, withholding treatment to meet organizational budget. And this plays very well in our resource limited settings. For example, our budgets are always limited. Can you scale up, for example, like that study that I showed, separating conjoint twins? So when you have resource allocation, it means one surgery is going to consume almost the entire budget of the surgical, pediatric surgical services. So you have to weigh where to go. So unless you get support from elsewhere, some of these conditions and the treatment can be withheld so that you meet the organizational demand. And another big elephant in the house is accepting money from big pharmaceutical and the device manufacturers. This is sometimes can be unethical, but we have to do it because there is no way you can do away without getting support from pharmaceutical companies. But this way, sometimes they can sway you doing getting only their supply from their devices. But I think this can be, cannot sometimes, cannot be avoided. The other thing which is not very common, I think getting romantically involved with the patients. So though sometimes when these parents are very vulnerable, coming from poor background, sometimes they can be really vulnerable and can, if someone is not ethical, a doctor can get romantically involved. Another common challenge is covering up mistakes because when you are working up in limited set, low limited settings, Mistakes are likely to occur from way from preoperative care, intraoperative, because you are improvising. And some of these mistakes can be covered up, which sometimes is very unethical. And repeat, reporting unethical or impaired colleagues, this can be challenging because if you are very few, and how can you go on reporting colleagues? Though it means when you report them, they can end up being picked by the law, and this can have dire consequences to future care of these children. Then the other condition, another scenario is cherry picking patients. Of course, when you have so many people demanding for surgery and so many children, for example, as, as I mentioned, you have to start picking out where you feel like the probably the prognosis is best. So like where children where prognosis is worst, you might end up not like, not uh, inadvertently neglecting them, which is very unethical. And another thing is practicing defensive medicine to avoid the malpractice. This can be very real and also breaching patient confidentiality. For example, those babies, that slide which I showed you, whereby so many children are lining up to see one doctor. Sometimes when you have two doctors in one room, there is no way you can keep confidentiality. Like patients might be even hearing the stories of, of the one another. 
These are the basic values of medical ethics. Autonomy, patients have a right to determine their own health care. But in resource limited countries, I don't think that these patients have very much rights to determine their own health care. But as we are realizing now, the society is becoming enlightened and we are having a middle class which is coming up. Some of them do read a lot about on the internet. So they might have, but even then you are supposed to exercise autonomy, but most of the time this cannot be real in our setting. Then another value is justice, okay, by distributing the benefits and the burdens of care across society. I don't think that one also can be realized very well in resource limited countries. Another one is doing good for the patients. I think this one, in fact, all the medical workers are supposed to have this. And another one, normal efficiency, which is making sure that we don't hurt our patients. But these are the values, core values, which I talked about in the medical school. But there are so many other values which you need to consider. Truth taking, truth telling is very important. Uh, you have support to tell the patients the truth about their conditions and what you are supposed to do and what you can be able to do. You don't want to tell your patient that you can do something which you, can, which you have never done, that will not be ethical. And of course, you are supposed to be transparent. And the most important thing, you are supposed to show in respect for the patients and the families. I mentioned earlier that it was uh, the previous slides that some of these patients are coming from poor families, but that knows, does not stop you from respecting even the core values of this patient, of the, other, the interest of these patients, and even their values. For example, they have, can have religious values, they can have beliefs, we are supposed to be respecting all of these aspects. Uh, most of the times, ethics can, ethics can be seen to be very prescriptive and telling you what you cannot do and what you can do. But if, if you practice ethics properly, it can be free and it can make you affirm you that you are doing the right thing when you go through the proper ethical thought process. Uh, maybe some of the tips how you can remain ethical even in the poor resource settings. You are supposed to listen properly, however busy you are, so that you learn all the facts about the, child, the child's condition, so that you don't rush into making decisions when you have not listened to the entire story. And this listening, and you are supposed to gather all what happens around because, for example, like treating and electrical malformations, you are supposed to know all the circumstances surrounding the family, everything, because that's the only way you can successfully treat these children. And you are supposed to communicate effectively and so that you provide all the necessary facts to the patients and relatives. And you are supposed to be tactful so that you win the confidentiality of these patients. So that, because if these patients lose confidence in you, you can never treat their conditions. But you always try to find time to explore all of the ESCO issues, even if you are over, being overwhelmed by your work. And you always try to, first, to pass responsibility to other qualified caregivers so that you are not overwhelmed by your work. Because if that happens, you are going to get burned out and you are not start becoming unethical and you might not be able to explore all the ethical issues surrounding the conditions you are treating. And you are supposed to respect the values as I said, and that to resolve with the patients. There are so many conflicting situations in the practice of pediatric surgery. Uh, some of the patients can refuse treating to your treatment and you might you can be faced by uh, respecting the autonomy of the patients 
why they're considering what is the best of the patient. And so that one can be a very difficult case scenario. Another circumstances which can be the conflicting, like as I said, a doctor you might be justified, for example, not to accept to see all the patients because you are going to burn out. But that means you are going to deny medical care to the patients. But you are supposed to be careful because if you are going to let in every patient you are, who comes in to get treatment, you might start becoming unethical. You don't listen to their stories. You rush out and you make rash decisions. So it's better you divide your time, you divide your clinics so that you can practice ethically while you're treating the patients. There are other issues like, uh, you know, our societies have a lot of religious backgrounds. So you are supposed to consider all of this. And for example, you have to understand it is a ethics, what is the difference between ethics and morality? Because whereas morality relies on basically on values which are adhere to basic beliefs and system and the code of conduct, medical ethics is relies on values and reasoning. So you are supposed to reason out when you are making such decisions when you are treating these patients. And morality is what relies on such authority like a Bible and, for example, political persuasions, whereas medical ethics is flexible because it relies on sets of solutions and it's based on facts and logic. So, but because our societies get all of these religious beliefs and the morality issues intertwined, sometimes it can be very difficult to wave your way when you are treating these patients. And then you have another issue like in addressing medic, medical ethics and the law. Usually medical ethics have different standards from the law. And the law always is created by legislators and may not share the same values and reasoning as for ethics for physicians. And this, for example, oh, I can give an example, an example when, for example, a doctor decides to treat a deep premature, whereas they consider they can say that ah, by the law demands that you are supposed to treat everyone, but a doctor can think that ah, this deep premature cannot probably make it. And so you are supposed to find a way between the law and the ethics, but I think you are, the ethics should take precedence over the law so that you can practice ethically. Thank you for listening. I welcome your comments. Thank you. Uh, John, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate what you have shared and I'm almost speechless and uh, I, my respect for you has multiplied 10 times while listening to your talk. Um, what you have shown us uh, is actually the way forward for us because uh, uh, you uh, the amount of research output you have shown and you you're not talking anecdotally you have proven most of the things what you preach what you advise you have proven it by scientific research and with such a limited resources with low income country like uganda with a huge population, so few pediatric surgeons, you have established systematically and you have shown if there is a will, there is a way. And you have also proven that in Africa, we don't sit and cry. We find local solutions for local problems. So thank you again. We have um, colleagues who are joining from various places in the world. So I'll just invite comments one by one and maybe uh, Dr. Emil may need to go to operating theater. So I'll invite uh, Dr. Sharif Emil uh, to, to give his comments. And I think, please let us keep comments short uh, at the most two minutes each expert. So Sharif, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Milind. I, I, uh, I am on call and I actually have Dr. Fabio Botello. You might see him here. He's a Brazilian pediatric surgeon who also works in a very low resource area and he's with us for some time here in Montreal. So Fabio has been watching with me as well. 
Um, I just want to echo what you said about John. I've always been completely fascinated by his work. And, and John, you're, the last part of your presentation, I have to say, is applicable to any setting, whether it's low resource, medium resource, or high resource. I think that fundamental set of ethics you laid out is really universal. And the same issues are the issues we deal with here. Um, I guess the one thing I, I would have liked to maybe hear a little bit about is, and I, I think you've, you've set up some great uh, models and examples of how a North-South collaboration can, can actually occur without surgical adventurism. Mm -hmm. um, but I think from you know, the, other, the other consultants here from Africa, I, I would actually like to hear a little bit of your views on how surgeons from other parts of the world can potentially uh, collaborate. Uh, th thank you, Sheriff. Um, I will invite uh, Professor Hadley uh, to, to comment because Professor Hadley um, uh, has practiced for many decades in Durban, uh, but he knows the situation in Africa inside out. And, and Prof Hadley, please comment. Yeah, uh, thanks, Melinda. Um, I would like to uh, share Dr. Emil's um, uh, plaudits for, for what John has achieved in Uganda. I think he's done a, a fantastic job. I would, whilst acknowledging the, the positive pediatric surgeons that Dr. Boita and uh, Dr. Sekabira have referred to, I think we're missing a trick. I think we're forgetting that pediatric surgery is a team sport and that training more pediatric surgeons and leaving them out there on their own is not going to help anybody one iota. Yeah. And what we've got to do is we've got to incorporate the training of our anesthetic teams, our intensive care unit teams, and particularly our nursing staff. And we've got to take them along the, uh, the road with us. The other thing I'd like to say is that, that a lot of what we do is not exactly rocket science. As, you know, a, a pediatric, you don't, need, you don't need 10 years of training to be able to drain an abscess. Um, and I think that, or make a colostomy or take out an appendix. Um, this is the sort of thing um, that we could train medical officers to do, or even people who are not doctors, as they are doing in, in Malawi, where you can train as a non-physician uh, pediatric surgeon with a limited range of uh, procedures that you could do. I had a limited range of procedures that I could do, um, so I don't think that that's in any way uh, demeaning. My third point that I'd like to make is that it's incumbent upon us working in Africa with these limited resources to vary our surgical techniques. There's no point in anastomosing a jejunal atresia and expecting to keep the child alive on TPN when you've got no TPN. Mm. So we've got to change our surgical strategy, make a, an anastomosis, make a bishop coup, put a transanastomotic feeding tube, to do, do something that gets us over this hurdle of re relying upon a resource that we don't have. Um, and so I think that we need to look, and instead of just aping what they're doing in the developed world, we've got to look at the strategies and match our strategies to the resources available. And the last thing I'd like to support your point, uh, Millind, and that is that it is unethical to practice pediatric surgery without reviewing your results and publishing your results so that we can all learn. So I think that at, at a very basic level, it's unethical to practice without doing research. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Prof. Hadley. And uh, when John was presenting um, his, his initial experience before uh, the kids OR um, arrived uh, in, um, in Uganda, I just re remembered my good old days uh, in, in Pune in India and in Mumbai in India while I was training in general surgery and in pediatric surgery, and then working again in general surgery, uh, looking after children, we had no surgical intensive care units. We had no TPN. And as John said, we managed to make survive newborns with esophageal atresia and diaphragmatic hernia in female surgical ward uh, with dedicated team of doctors who uh, bag masked the babies for 48 hours uh, at a stretch. So, so uh, I'm so blessed that uh, then subsequently I could spend time in Glasgow and in South Africa, I mean, we really cannot complain about lack of resources. So that is, that is really what John has opened my eyes once again. 
Um, is Dr. Harper still here? Dr. Harper is a pediatrician and a neonatologist, and he's head of the Department of Pediatrics at the Freyer Hospital. I saw him initially. If uh, Kim is here, Kim, can you unmute yourself and give comments? Or has Dr. Harper left? Um, maybe he has left. So if I don't see Dr. Harper, can I then invite Dr. Kululeko Majola, who is our consultant pediatric surgeon to give his comments, please, Dr. Majola? Thanks, Prof. Um, just want to echo uh, just our gratitude to John for his um, great talk and just to opening our eyes um, to what we are really complaining about is much worse with what they have um, in other countries. So we are blessed in that sense. And just to head out as well, just for a, a, a great talk, just to get us through to discussing such um, topics at length. So that's all, thank you. Um, before I invite Dr. Machaya, I just like to openly um, sort of share a request with uh, my, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Emil, that um, uh, we will communicate privately about establishing a link between uh, Montreal and East London in South Africa. And uh, we will see how uh, your trainees can come and spend at least a month or six weeks as an observer in East London, and how we can get one of our trainees to spend, say, four weeks in your department. So I think that will be mutually beneficial, for not only for those respective trainees, but also for uh, the growth of our department. So we will communicate uh, privately. And uh, now I'll invite Dr. Selo Machaya. Dr. Machaya is our another pediatric surgical consultant. And the interesting thing is um, during his training uh, as a pediatric surgeon, he has actually done his master's in pediatric surgery on um, gastroschisis in the Eastern Cape. And uh, I think his comments will be quite valuable. So Dr. Machaya. Uh, thanks, Prof. Uh, thanks, Karat, for the talk. And uh, thanks, John, as well, for um, giving us your insight and uh, and giving us your point of view as to how things are actually in, in the rest of Africa. I think what's important as well, what you were just highlighting now, uh, Prof, is how it, what's important in the way forward in training uh, new pediatric surgeons. It's not just an interprovincial or interdepartment uh, communication or transfer of training uh, fellows, registers, but intercontinental, if possible. Because what you actually see in South Africa, it's very dynamic, where you can be in one part of South Africa and you think you're in the middle of Europe, then you're in another part of, of South Africa and you think you in the middle of some jungle somewhere. So it shows how diverse even in a country is and how I'm a firm supporter of actually allowing um, trainees to actually experience um, training in other facilities, um, not only just to gain experience from um, that sp specific facility, but also to see how other parts of the country are functioning and ultimately how the rest of the world is functioning because you can't li live in your own little bubble and believe that um, how you are functioning is how the rest of the country or how the rest of the world is. You need to actually be out there and see um, what's actually happening. So um, these kind of collaborations actually improve pediatric surgery. They spark interest, um, not necessarily in the individuals in pediatric surgery, but on the other people around them who actually they interact with um, to see passion and to see dedication um, that one person has. And as Prof Hadley was saying that um, it requires a lot of work. It's not just one pediatric surgeon placed in the middle of nowhere who will all of a sudden bring change. Um, lots of elements um, have to come into play, lots of ingredients to make the, the cake called a good functioning uh, pediatric surgery. But ultimately, let me just, last words. Um, I think it's Voltaire, might be mistaken. He said, um, the perfect is the enemy of good. And that actually, that phrase or saying stems very well because we try to be perfect, um, try to give the best to every patient, which we should. But when we are in resource limited 
uh, areas, you find that as John was saying, you can literally exhaust the fund of the whole department on one child. And when we're in pediatric surgery, like in our setting where we are not the only ones who are um, catered to in ICU, if our child is in ICU and is found to have a poor prognosis, they are already blocking a bed for 10 other mm -hmm. pediatric patients with uh, croup or uh, upper airway obstruction or whatever pathology it is um, from entry, entry into the ICU and getting a, a short period of intensive care and having a good outcome. So it's one of these things where you have to kind of weigh, um, not necessarily that you are already putting the patient on a bed note and saying, you are a non-starter, we're not gonna do anything, but where your options? Um, if you have 10 beds, ICU ventilated beds, and you have 20 patients that all need the bed, you have to literally say, um, look at the prognosis, look at the outcome of each patient and be able to cater to any, all of them. If we had 10, 20 beds for these 20 patients, fair enough, everyone gets a bed. But in reality, which is what we see in South Africa and definitely in the rest of Africa, and maybe even in the first world, you have to make uh, difficult choices. And it's by experiencing and seeing how other facilities, centers function that you can actually make a good informed decision other than reading, which you all can do. Um, it's via experience and via communication and all these factors that you can actually be a holistic uh, pediatric surgeon and um, try to do your best. Yeah, that's all, Prof. Thanks. Thank you, Silo. Very, very wise words that our country is such a mix, uh, which is very interesting mix of, of yeah, you correctly said Europe and, and middle of nowhere, but, but um, I'm actually <laughs> encouraging one of our trainees in the future when that training completes to, uh, if possible, go to one of those three provinces where there is no pediatric surgeon. So we're trying our best. So before, uh, I think it's time to conclude the meeting. John, please unmute yourself and uh, final words from you. And John, before you say your final words, um, I give you an open invitation to visit East London in South Africa. Um, when the COVID nonsense is over, we can privately communicate and we would love to have you for at least a couple of days uh, in East London. So let's talk maybe 2022, 2023. So John, final word from you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nerine. Thank you for allowing for this opportunity to present at this meeting. Maybe what I can reiterate is that uh, ethical decisions can never be avoided. Whenever doctors or surgeons or like pediatric surgeons make any clinical decisions, we are invariably or inadvertently making an, an ethical decisions. So in all our practice, there is always medical ethics. Mm. Thank you, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the attendees for their contribution. Um, the meeting is recorded, so I will post the link uh, to the Google Drive um, in about half an hour to 45 minutes. The next week's meeting will be open only to the staff of our department. And so we will meet the rest of the uh, attendees and delegates in two weeks time on a Tuesday evening. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Good morning, wherever you are. Good night, John. Thank you. See good, you. Good night, Mary. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.